other, the others on the board have been here since the start. They not only did everything necessary to make this thing happen, but are still doing that here. And Lucille is one of those as well. Uh, what Lucille can tell you all, all of her stories, but the one I like is that as editor of the journal, Concord Journal, she started to do some research about this situation and more and more became uh, not just someone to report on this, but to be involved in such a way that this was, this was a passion for her as well as the others. So we thank you all for coming. And uh, I also want to say, as uh, I haven't read her book yet, it's just out. Uh, I'm, my, my personal business is in the book publishing uh, field. And I can just tell, just, you know, say you can read a book you can or you can buy its cover, whatever. <laughs> the back cover, the front cover, and inside. And, and uh, I knew she was going to mention me in here, and I found myself in there, and no typos. Come so on. this is a good Come book. On. Thanks very much, Ken. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm sorry that this, the space is so small that I'm not able to show you slides of the pictures of the house, the way it looked in 1995 when it first went on the market, because you would be shocked and you, and you would know, um, along with those of us who were there at the time, here at the time, uh, what a miracle it is that we're sitting here in this beautiful space right now. So uh, the book does have, the, I don't know if you can see it, but the book does have a picture of the house, the way it looked when the town purchased it, and uh, and some, some pictures inside of the interior and exterior along the way. It was a long, it was an epic of, of restoration. But the, the house now, and we are now in Virginia Road, which was um, laid down in 1691. And it was laid down, one of the oldest ha uh, streets in Concord, to, um, to help the farmers who lived here. This, this was called the East Quarter of Concord. In the 1650s, Concord was divided and land given to settlers to farm. And so um, this was one of the oldest sections, and it was a farming community. The Thoreau family joined that farming community in 1798. Um, and that's when Cynthia's grandmother, uh, when uh, Thoreau's grandmother, Mary Dunbar, married Jonas Myatt, Minot, Captain Jonas Myatt, who was a Revolutionary War hero. Um, she, had, she was a widow. And so Thoreau's, sister, uh, Thoreau's mother, Cynthia, was 11 at the time. So she moved, Thoreau's mother at 11, moved to the farm here on Virginia Road. Now at that time, this house was located about 300 yards west, but it was on the same, the same uh, farm. At the time, um, Jonas Minot had built the farm up to 125 acres, so, uh, at, and it was fairly common at the time to move homes. So later on, I'll tell you a little bit about the fact that the house was moved. The interesting thing, and one of the interesting things, so I don't forget to tell it, is that our founding, the founding president of the Thoreau Farm Trust, Joe Wheeler, who is here with us today, was born in the house that now stands where this house originally stood. So he had a very special, and his mother, Ruth Wheeler, was an editor of the Concord Journal, and she was a Concord historian. And so that house actually has its own special, um, special aura, special presence of, of, about it. So this project for Joe was, a, was a, um, close to his heart. Um, so what happened was that um, Cynthia, Thoreau's mother, um, lived here in about until 1812, and then she married. And her husband John was a shopkeeper, and they owned a shop. Um, they lived above the shop on Monument Square. And in 1813, Jonas Minot died. And his wife, Thoreau's grandmother, said to her daughter and new husband, why don't you move to the farm? Because I'm entitled as the widow to a third, the, what they called a widow's third. And so this room where we're sitting and the room above it was her third, along with some other areas of the house, the kitchen, and some storage areas that she was allowed to use. So uh, Cynthia, Thoreau's mother, and her new husband, John, moved in. And they, this was in 1813, and they were try, going to try to make a, a go of the farm again. Um, 1813 began a difficult, some difficult years of, of, of weather. And so, in fact, in 1816, that we call that the year without, um, without a summer. So uh, the year before Thoreau was born, the crops were devastated throughout New England. And they, were, they were 
really struggling very, um, very hard to make this work. Thor was born in 1817, and by that time, Cynthia and John had given up. So within eight months of Thoreau's birth, they had to move off the farm. But when you think about it, if you think beginning in 1798 to 1818, the Thoreau family had a 20-year connection to this farm. Um, grandmother, mother, who lived for 14 <coughs> years, and then Thoreau, who was born here. Um, then Thoreau, the, the Thoreaus owned, a, I, I believe it was seven homes in, in Concord. Some of them don't exist any longer. The last one they owned is, is on Main Street across from the Concord Academy campus. It's called the Yellow House, and it's the house where Thoreau died. They purchased it in 1850, and Thoreau died there in 1862. Um, and 16 years after that, after <laughs> Thoreau's death, this house was moved. And that was a, a common practice at the time. When a young person got married, often the family wanted to build a new house for that young person and would move the existing house to a different part of the property and build a new place, which is what happened. When the house was moved, it was moved off of its central chimney. It had a huge central chimney, and it had a lean-to in the back. It was moved off of that, transported here. Um, and so what was left were the, were the two rooms over two um, and much, much simpler home. So uh, it's an interesting history that the, that the house has. And we had to, as a, as a town and as a Thorough Farm Trust, we had to figure out how to interpret that and how to incorporate the life of the, of the house into the story of, of Thorough's birth here. So it was complicated. Um, so what, I, what I'd like to do today is, is just read a little bit about, uh, read a little bit from the book. And I'm just picking excerpts from all over the place to give you a sense of the tone of the book and um, kind of what you might find there. And I thought I would start just on the first day that I found out that the house was in danger. Um, so this is how that happened. When you're editor of the weekly newspaper in an iconic New England town like Concord, Massachusetts, Thursday is come to Jesus day. <laughs> the papers hit the stands and mailboxes that morning and the phones start ringing before you arrive at your desk. Not yet fully recovered from Tuesday's late night deadline pressure and Wednesday's rush to print. Oily shreds of salty potato chips poke up from between your computer keys, and your abandoned coffee mug is thick with a kind of mossy growth usually found in a Petri dish. <laughs> Typically, the day's callers had been roused from their reading to report a typo, a missing calendar item, an opinion that angered them, or a worst case scenario, a serious error that has eluded even your closest scrutiny. I had come to dread Thursdays. It would, only, it would take only one legitimate gripe to ruin my mood, and most weeks served to remind me all too painfully that many eyes don't always make right work. This account begins on one of those Thursdays, one that in the end would redeem all the rest. On December 14, 1995, a worried caller, Doris Smith, who lived next door um, on Virginia Road, she no longer does, but, but um, she was a longtime resident then, so Doris relayed a pressing concern that would alter my life and the life of our town. Doris told me she and her husband George lived next door to the farmhouse where Henry David Thoreau was born, and that if something weren't done quickly, the house would likely be torn down. It's difficult to venture anywhere in Concord without a reminder that you're treading in Thoreau's footsteps. But a farm on Virginia Road, nearly four miles from Walden Pond, and well off the path that draws scholars uh, students and pilgrims to Concord by the hundreds of thousands each year, that was news to me. Smith sounded measured and reasonable, and best of all, she was seeking help, not atonement. <laughs> she told me the neighboring farmhouse, which had been privately owned since it was built in the 18th century, had been put on the market by Ruth Breen and her daughters, Geraldine and Dorothy. Mrs. Mrs. Breen's husband, James Jr., had recently died, reportedly while working in his field and his wife had not, uh, didn't feel she could manage the farm by herself. At the time of Smith's call, things had already advanced with alarming speed. Developers had quickly shown interest in purchasing the property for a small housing development, and one had even proposed demolishing Thoreau's birth house, which had deteriorated markedly over time, unless it could be sold and moved off the property. Not long after Doris Smith's call, the Breen family allowed me to visit the house. Ruth had moved in with Geraldine in, in Maynard, neighboring town, and the house had been vacant for several months. Emptied of the human presence and family furnishings, it felt weary and forlorn. The compact two-story house faced south, 
its small living room, which is where we are, in the east, on the east side, separated from the kitchen and the dining area on the west side by a narrow winding staircase that rose from the tiny foyer uh, just inside the front door. After making my way up the rickety wooden steps to the second floor, I entered the empty bedroom, the east chamber right above us, where David Henry Thoreau had been born. On graduating from Harvard College in 1837, Thoreau would reverse the order of his given names since everyone uh, called him Henry and he preferred that name to David. The original wide pine floorboards creaked in welcome and without warning I was overcome with emotion. I realized a little sheepishly, for I'd always thought of myself as a practical, feet on the ground kind of person, that what I was feeling was awe. The poet Mallarmé believed an artist should depict not, not the thing, but the effect it produces. No one would have called the little room with its faded wallpaper, peeling window frames, and layers of dust awesome. But awe was the effect it produced on me. And I, could find, and I would find over time that I was not alone. My surprise arose in large part because I was not in any scholarly sense a Thoreauvian. I had read Walden rather perfunctorily as a student and had come to appreciate the beauty of Walden Pond during my almost 20 years of working and living in and near Concord. I had especially appreciated the essay Civil Disobedience and Walking and could muster some of Henry's famous axioms on demand as could pretty much anyone in town. <laughs> I believed that in wildness is the preservation of the world and aspired as best I could to simplify, simplify. In my, my, my white mountain hikes and my saunters along the familiar trails of home, Thoreau had served as an inspiration to slow down, forget peak bagging and mileage counts, and remember that heaven is under our feet. But that day, in this house, something entirely new was happening to me. It was more a feeling than a thought. Here was where the genius of Thoreau had been brought into the world. Everything he'd accomplished, all he'd written, what he still meant so many, had risen from this place. In that bedchamber, I had unexpectedly discovered a different Thoreau, the Henry with a heartbeat. This Henry belonged to his family and to the town he would later dub the most estimable place in the world. I liked this Henry. I wanted to get to know all about him. And most of all, I wanted to help prevent him from being uprooted from the place where he had first seen the sun, his morning star. Today, after years of negotiations, delays, and fundraising, the house once again rests securely on a portion of the original farm where Thora was born. It remains simple and unassuming, a reflection of Henry's full life as a son, brother, friend, and citizen. True to the original vision, it's become the site of lively, interactive programs for all ages, designed to highlight Thoreau's forward-thinking ideas and explore the many ways his life and work continued to urge us to action. So that was sort of how it, it began. Um, and the, um, <coughs> there are a lot of interesting things. Um, but one is the fact that today this really wouldn't happen in this exact way. People don't um, receive news and, and disperse news in, in the way that they did in 1995. Things have changed so much. So some of what I've write, written about here is a little bit of a story of the way the Concord Journal and other newspapers, the Boston Globe eventually, uh, the Baltimore Sun, the Associated Press, how, how newspapers, print newspapers, uh, actually helped say, uh, spread the word. So at one point, I'll talk a little bit about it. It's hard to believe today that there was a time when people turned first to their local newspaper to get the word out about their concerns and opinions. The Concord Journal was a well-read source of local information and included editorials, columns, letters, and op-ed pieces written almost entirely by its own journalists and town residents. It was truly a go-to local resource whose staff kept their feet on the street. We had computers and email at the time, but we're only just beginning to have a website presence. Hard, it's hard, really hard to imagine. <laughs> really hard to imagine. We still printed pages on a press and edited them by hand on drafting tables using exacto knives that regularly sent editors to the first aid station or occasionally the ER. For me, that hands-on work retains a romantic aura, despite the band-aids. At times, I can't help but wonder what, effect, what the effects of a social media campaign would have been if Dora Smith and her small band of amateur preservationists had been equipped with the tools to mount a full-fledged online advocacy and crowdfunding campaign. 
The internet did exist in 1995, of course, and organizations were beginning to set up websites. Smith and her fellow activists had, in fact, set up their own. At, at the time she contacted the Concord Journal, Smith suggested at one of her meetings that their group put out a plea on their web page for public donations to save the birthplace. But the social media phenomenon would not take hold until a couple of years later, and such an appeal wouldn't have had much impact at the time. Had they possessed today's ability to reach a worldwide audience at the click of a send button, such an appeal would likely have elicited an immediate flurry of responses and maybe a, a substantial number of donations via PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> missing from it all, <laughs> missing from it all, however, would have been the personal investment needed over the long term to meet what would develop into a complex, multi-layered challenge. In his provocative article called Small Change, Why the Revolution Won't Be Tweeted, this was published in The New Yorker in October 2010, Malcolm Glad Gladwell acknowledges the capacity of Facebook and other networking sites to alert people to pressing issues and gather likes and other modes of support from a distance. But he says, and I quote, the platforms of social media are built around weak ties, unquote. What are needed when things get complicated, he seemed to be saying, when vision is required, when intricate planning must be carried out, and when ongoing negotiations become necessary are strong ties that link people to each other and to the work at hand. I'll quote again a bit from him. He said, social networks are effective at increasing participation by lessening the level of motivation that participation requires. It's interesting. Um, in other words, we might send some money to a cause that catches our attention, but that's an easy commitment light way to participate. What is needed to advance a complex and nuanced cause is exactly what we had at the time. People willing to put themselves in the line by using their, their social capital in an up close and personal way, knowing they were putting it at risk for a cause that might fail. Thoreau beat us all to this insight when he wrote in Walden, the cost of a thing is the amount of what I, shall, I will call life, which is required to be exchanged for it, immediately or in the long run. And there are many of people in this room who exchange a lot of life to, uh, to, make, this, to make this happen. Um, and it's interesting that um, we're, we're celebrating the incorporation of the Thoreau Farm Trust. And it's actually, there are two phases to this. What we were celebrating outside what Marsha and Jane were celebrating outside was really the first phase, 1995 to 1997, when um, the house came on the market in May of 95, and it took two years to build support to, to restore the house, to raise the funds to do that, and then for the town meeting to vote. It took two town meetings for the town meeting to vote to purchase it in 1997. Um, so the town owned the house beginning in June 1997. Um, and at that point, the house was sold and the 20 acres of farmland for $960,000. That was the purchase price. And the town paid only $160,000 of that out of their reserve capital funds. The rest was, as, as Marcia um, read, was, was uh, contributed by donors who, who, who major donors over $1,000, a lot of small donors. Um, Sally Snitcher, who is here today, her son was part of a lemonade stand that, that <laughs> and they were proudly turned over $27.56 to the cause one day, and very proud, and they were participants, and they're listed among the donors on, in the town's official records. So it, it was a, a really large and, and, and broad um, uh, level of support, which actually I, I published Sally's a speech about the folks who, who donated um, a, as an appendix, and I think it's really worth reading because it, it shows you the number of people over a two-year period. There were people who, I mean, maybe one or two who were interested initially, and then suddenly it grew to this enormous, um, to this enormous effort. Um, but in 1998, the Thorough Farm Trust was formed because the town said, we can't do any more financially. We're done. So citizens have to step up. And and at that point, we thought, well, it's going to be upwards of a million dollars to restore the house and then plan how it's going to be reused. You have to do it all. And so that's when the Thorough Farm Trust was born. Many of us who had been active in the initial uh, saving of the property stepped up. There were 15 of us, all volunteers, no executive director, 
And Cord Booth, who was our first treasurer, reported to us at a meeting in 1998 that we had $50.06 in the brand new Middlesex Bank account that he had just opened for us. $50.06. So, you know, we were talking about Thoreau's faith in a seed. Um, indeed. <laughs> there was a lot of trust and there was also a lot of faith that we had to put into the, to the project. So that's, that's where it started. But we benefited from the help of a lot of friends. And um, I had this little note at, in one of the chapters that says members, spouses, and friends also donated um, hours of their time to help with everything from financial analysis to mowing the lawn outside. We were all learning, some more literally than others, what grassroots activism really meant. Uh, in one note to the board that summer, our president, Joe Wheeler, um, he, was, he was concerned. He mentioned his dismay that attendance at our meetings had been low. And he was worried that difficulty of getting enough of you busy people, he, he wrote, I'm having trouble getting you busy people together. <laughs> and uh, one of the people who had volunteered to help us was my father-in-law, Fred Stott, who was a, a, a wonderful um, development professional. And he, he advised uh, Joe at the time. He said, good news, Joe, is that you have very busy people on your board who are in high demand. Bad news? is that you have very busy people on your board who are in high demand. And I'm sure that a lot of you who have volunteered on boards have, have come up with, a, with the same issue, but it, it all worked out. But at, at the, so in the same, the same note, um, Joe writes, for the last board meeting, two members used the excuse that they had just had or were about to have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> all right, he says, all right, congratulations, but don't try to use that excuse too often. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that one, Joe? <laughs> so that, that's kind of the, those are a little bit of the, that's the, the nitty gritty, but I w want to go back to the introduction to give you a, a more of an overview of kind of how it, how it all worked um, from the beginning. And I want to just acknowledge that Brian Davis and Richard Fallender, who were on the Concord Journal staff at the time, really helped get this story um, get this story moving, and I, we couldn't, I couldn't have done it about it. We, it was really an interesting team to work on that story together, um, and I won't forget that. So here's the introduction. It starts, this story has a happy ending. But the course of saving an underappreciated national treasure never did run smooth, and the rescue of Henry David Thoreau's birthplace was no exception. From the day in May 1995, when James Breen Jr., the last private owner of the house and surrounding farmland, died at age 81, in the fields he had worked since he was a boy, it would take 15 years for the historic house to be saved, restored, and revived. During that time, partnerships would be formed and dissolved, plans would be devised and discarded, hopes would be raised and dashed, and friendships would be forged and tested. Those who remember the slow, tortuous process that led to the house's resurrection continue to shake their heads at the many starts and stops along the way. But they also acknowledge the value of having given the project the time and consideration it needed to be done right. There are so many urgent needs, urgent ills, that need our attention and help. It's perhaps <laughs> hard to understand why saving the birthplace of a man who was born in 1817 was worthy of the time, effort, and money it took to make it happen. Yet everyone who helped, whether with time, effort, or money, felt connecting, connected to something larger. When we try to articulate the reasons for our dedication, we point most often to Thoreau's significance as a poetic visionary whose continuing relevance is undeniable. We had a sense at the time that if we were willing to discard the birthplace of one of the, our great American original thinkers, we were excising a precious piece of our collective consciousness. But there was something else at work on us as well. We didn't think in these terms, but looking back on the intellectual, emotional, and physical effort it took to persist in the face of repeated setbacks and the need to rely on collaboration and cooperation to get the job done, we were joined in a fellowship of caring for the birthplace and for each other. The practice of caring becomes a habit. Many of those involved in saving the thorough birthplace had developed that habit long before and had been practicing some form of community activism ever since. Some of us were novices. For me, the effort to save the birthplace served as an awakening and a reason to remain awake to the dangers of a life without principle. To care about this house was to care about it all. 
The impetus to take on the retrospective account grew out of my visit to the birthplace uh, on J July 12th, 2017. I don't know how many of you were here for Henry's 200th birthday. It was a wonderful day, wonderful day. Um, at most, a couple of dozen of the scores of visitors who've, uh, who, I'm sorry, the light is a little bit um, dark, so I'm having a little difficult, who passed through the house that day remembered, as I did, how dilapidated it once had been and the effort it took over so many years to bring it back to life. The history of the house and the details of its restoration and rehabilitation have been um, expertly documented by architect Larry Sorley, who is here, and an architecture, an architectural historian Anne Forbes, uh, Anne McCarthy Forbes, who is here, and I want to hold that up. This yeah, is their 170 page oh, yeah. um, yeah. his historic structure report. Wow. So this has the whole history of the house, all of its inhabitants, uh, so much work went into it, and um, a history with a pictorial history of how it was restored along with the strategy that was, was behind it. It's a wonderful, and it's now, it's now in the um, uh, special collections of the Concord Free Public Library, and this, um, I'm very honored to say that this will become a companion document to it. Um, because this, this will show the, this story shows the people and, um, and this shows the, the, the structure and so it's, uh, but if you have, if you're interested in old houses, this is a wonderful document, it's beautifully done. Um, so that had been done, but I realized that had been done, but no one had yet chronicled the citizen effort to save the house in the first place and time was running out. Already a few of the early participants were no longer with us and memories were fading fast. Yet I'm not sure I would have launched the project had it not been for two additional catalysts. The first was our country's, I'm going to mention it, 2016 presidential election. <laughs> By the time of my 2017 visit to the birth house, many Americans were feeling despair at the growing divisiveness that had begun to tear us apart as a nation and powerless to do anything about it. More than ever, at a time when our citizenship was being put to a severe test, it felt important to remind people not only of the importance of mining Thoreau's writings for solace and inspiration, but also of the positive influence concerned citizens could still exert if they joined hands and hearts to make things better. The public-private partnership that saved Thoreau's birthplace is an invigorating example of what people can do for good when they care enough to seek common ground. Faced with the possible destruction of the property, we were forced to reach out across political and social divides to build a coalition of fellow advocates. If we had refused to work together, we would have failed. The second catalyst was the 2017 publication of a new biography, Henry David Thoreau, A Life, by Laura Dassau Walls. I highly recommend it if you haven't read that book. Uh, I think it's going to go down as a definitive Thoreau biography. It's just beautifully done. Um, a visitor to Thoreau's birthplace, I don't know if you've seen in the, in the foyer, there's a bulletin board and you can leave notes about what your visit to Thoreau Farm meant to you and what living deliberately means to you. And one, one person wrote um, at one point, I came here to meet him at last. Um, <laughs> this is precisely how I felt as I read Wall's biography, a meticulously researched, elegantly written story of a complex man few have come to know and appreciate. Walls writes in her preface, Thoreau earned the devotion of friends who saw in him no saint, but something perhaps more rare, a humane being living a whole human life. That was the Thoreau we sought to represent and honor at his restored birthplace. For those of us involved, the act of saving the house was not about preserving a historic landmark or creating a museum, a distinguished museum, and several well-appointed period houses already operated in town and no one needed another one. The purpose of restoring this house was to honor Thoreau's intimate connection with his family and hometown and to remind people that despite the mythology that persists in exiling him to the margins of society, most of his days were busily spent in the heart of his community. <clears throat> By trying so hard to save Thoreau's birthplace in the face of skepticism at best and dismissal at worst, we hoped the simple farmhouse where it all began would expand people's understanding of the genius and visionary who found in both nature and human companionship a bracing way to live and a graceful way to die. It seemed not only good but necessary to honor the 41 years, 9 months, and 29 days Henry David Thoreau did not live at Walden Pond. <laughs> 
Um, and the last, the last thing um, I'm going to read is the, it's a little bit of the afterword. What, what I asked as I did the interviews for this book um, and probe people's memories, I wanted to ask them what it meant to them after this, all this time, 20 years, to think it back on it. What did this mean? To you, and I have, I'm not going to read them all, but I have a few comments that I'd, I'd like to read from different perspectives, people who approach the project from different perspectives. The epigraph for this particular chapter, the afterword, um, I think is particularly pertinent. It's a, it's a note that Henry wrote to his friend in, uh, uh, Harrison Blake in a letter. And Henry says to Blake, if you've been to the top of Mount Washington, let me ask, what did you find there? Going up there and being blown on is nothing. It is after we get home that we really go over the mountain, if ever. What did the mountain say? What did the mountain do? Um, and that was the kind of that was the, the idea that I was trying to elicit from folks. What did what did this project say? What did it do for you? Um, Nancy Grohl. I don't know if she made it today. Nancy was our executive director at the time when the our house, the house was purchased and and shepherded us all through the restoration. Um, she was fabulous, and what she said. But the project presented a great opportunity for me professionally, but it quickly evolved into a more personal mission. And that was so true for all of us, really. The more I learned about Henry, the more he began to permeate all aspects of my life. And the inspiration he brought to so many became a tremendous motivator for me. The importance of the birthplace to so many people near and far was uplifting and often kept me going, despite how overwhelming and daunting the project could be at times. When the house finally opened, Knowing that I had played a part in saving the house for all the Thoreauvians to come was the ultimate reward. Um, and Larry, I call Larry our house whisperer. <laughs> um, Larry had um, this to say in, in part from the, our conversations. For Larry Sorley, the experience became a fascinating detective story that kept offering up clues to century-old secrets. Sorley, a self-described thorough lover who joined the Thorough Society at the age of 15, has left his personal mark on every room in this house. Larry worked hands-on with this house. He didn't just design it, but he, he did a lot of the work himself. Um, most architects don't know how to pick up a hammer, he says, he says with a laugh, um, as he recalled his hands-on work. The Thorough birthplace became the highlight of my career, mainly because I was given so much freedom by the Thorough Farm Trust to get, take control of nearly all aspects of the restoration and rehabilitation project. So that's wonderful. Uh, from the town perspective, Selectman Sally Schnitzer, who was involved from the very beginning, where's Sally sitting, Sally, um, just kept us on track and kept us thinking thorough, thorough, thorough. Because sometimes when we were in, in really the throes of wondering whether we were going to be able to do this. It was tempting to, to think maybe we should do something else here or not, not, not keep it a nonprofit. There were all kinds of ideas out there. Um, and, and you kept us very much on, this is all about Thoreau. Let's make sure that we stay true to the original vision. So Sally, uh, as part of our conversation, said, <clears throat> I'm left with the thought that what has evolved on the property is quite true to the original vision. It's a thoughtful, collaborative farm with kids and adults engaged in learning, reflection, and productive work. It has remained simple in appearance and spirit, and it honors Thorough, the town of Concord, and the Breen family. It is certainly a testament to those who stuck with it for so many years, including you, Sally. <laughs> and then Marsha Rasmussen, who helped us from the town staff perspective so, so often and so patiently <laughs> as, as we made our way through um, all of the, um, the detail work. Marcia said in our conversation, well, first she acknowledged her surprise and occasional dismay <laughs> at, at the length of time the town owned the property. The town owned the pro bought the property in 1997, and we took title to the property in 2007. That, and so in, in, at that town meeting in 97, they never would have predicted that they would have owned that property for 10 years. And luckily, we were able to be partners during that time, you know, mowing the lawn and helping paint and doing all those kinds of things. But still, it was, it was a town property for 10 years. Um, so the town owned it before it was permanently adopted, restored, and reused. But Rasmussen says she remains convinced that the time and care that went into saving and re reviving the house and farm reflect Concord's best side calling the effort one of the most remarkable town projects she's been involved in in a, in a more than 30-year career. 
Rasmussen said she was especially impressed by the willingness of people of different minds to compromise in order to reach shared goals. It was an extraordinary community building experience. It's a wonderful perspective. And then the last paragraph I'm going to read today is just the, um, uh, the overall sense I got from all the, a lot of the other interviews that I did. So the early advocates who spoke to me about their involvement, including Dora Smith, a woman who called me first, Helen Bowden, who is here today, um, Joe Valentine and Michael Kellett, who could not be here today, Joe Wheeler, Court Booth, Jack Green from the Education Collaborative of Greater Boston, which contributed to the project. So I interviewed all of them. They all pointed, every one of them, all pointed to other people who they believed had done more than they had. Um, during the conversations, I never failed to ask leading questions about the impact of the experience on people's lives and work. What had the house said to them? What had it done? What I heard in response over and over was not deep philosophical insight, but something much more buoyant, joy. The delight everyone expressed at recalling the shared struggle and positive result emerged as the lasting effect, outliving disagreements, frustrations, and fatigue. It was better than any other lesson I could have hoped for. So that, that's just a little piece. so much for coming in. It's so wonderful to see so many faces who shared it in this story. So I only wrote, read little bits, but a lot of you are in here that don't know you are in here. So um, it was really a wonderful collaborative effort. And, I, and as I think Marcia said, I don't know how many people heard Marcia say this outside, or Jane, I think, said it outside, that not sure this could have hap could happen today, and we have to bring it back. You know, the feeling that we can work together. And, and, and I'm not being... Um, you know, naive when I say we were definitely on, on we crossed political divides, we, we crossed um, social divides to, to make this happen. And no one, there were disagreements for sure, there were disappointments for sure, but there was no name calling or, you know, and, and, and even the people who disagreed in the end, everyone came together to celebrate together which doesn't happen too often any longer. So, in any case, it's a great so, story. Do you, do you want to take a few questions? Uh, I, do people, would people have questions? Well, if, so if you I do, wonder if you could fill us in a little bit on your other roles with the Thor Farm Trust, because today we know you as editor of the journal, but you, were, you got engaged <laughs> in a number of different ways, right? Yeah, well, Lead, I, Leading question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they, these two guys from the conference journal will know that you know it's been difficult with a small staff to be the person who writes the editorials and the person who reports the news. You have to be really <laughs> careful, especially when you get passionate about a story. So um, ultimately, um, Richard and, and, and Brian wrote the stories, and then we would work together on how we would want to editorialize, and it was very much a team effort. But after I left the Concord Journal, um, I returned to Concord Academy and stayed on, on, on as the, uh, on the Thorough Farm Trust, and I became the second president after Joe. Joe shepherded us through our first five years when we started with $50.06 in the May, and, um, and then I was president for the next six uh, through the, the acquisition, and, the, and then Nancy McJenner took over the year of, that it opened. So, who's that in the hallway? Um, and then I stayed on, and, and I still am very connected, love to come back to the house, and every time I come back, I read those bulletin boards, um, messages because they're really, really a testament to the fact that Thoreau keeps moving everyone forward and also that he doesn't just prompt people to think but he prompts people to act because all oh, that board is filled with things people are doing to live deliberately um, so it's, it's a really interesting place um, is there, are there any other questions yeah uh, I just want to uh, recall a, a gentleman John Mack who I think I'm yes. about to yes. here. I can see his name on the board out there but John and Lauren were, were very central to this I think a uh, question today in today's political climate, which came up in a brief instant yesterday evening, <laughs> <laughs> talking to the Academy about Republicans and Democrats. Uh, I used to work in the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs with a guy named Bob Duran, Secretary of the Environment, who was a Democrat. And he worked very closely with a Republican governor named Paul Salucci uh, of Hudson and so forth. And together they came up with this uh, CPA, Community Preservation Act, with a percentage of the. And, you know, very expensive house would go towards uh, various things, including this. 
What did the Community Preservation Act uh, do as far as contributing, either by the town or separately from the town? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. <clears throat> when the town purchased the property in 1997, the Community Preservation Act we, we even wasn't, um, didn't exist even at the state level. So it was after that. So the town had promised in 1997 that it would not spend any more municipal funds on this house to restore the house. When the Preservation Act passed, Concord, I think it took two town meetings to vote on that and to approve that. Um, in the first year that it, a it asked for proposals, we declined to apply because we felt that we were not allowed to apply because the town had said it would never spend any more municipal dollars. And some of these dollars were coming out of tax, you know, they were coming out of tax dollars. But we, then, we, then after that year, we, the former select people who were, were with us at the time that the house was purchased would come to us and say, well, why aren't you applying for this? The money is on the table. You're leaving money on the table, right? And so we had several meetings. And of course, we did a lot of behind the scenes work with uh, t town officials and town staff members saying, do we have the right to do this? And, you know, you, what do you think? And uh, to a person, we never got a refusal. They said, yes, 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 you should definitely apply. So the second round for Concord, we applied and we received a $200,000 grant. Wow. And, that, and toward our $800,000 goal, that was substantial. And it really, really pushed us forward. Um, I do want to go back to John Mack. Um, he is not here. There is a, a substantial... A piece of a chapter here on on John, who we Anne actually dubbed as our benevolent warrior. Um, he was he was fierce in his in his beliefs, but kind um, in the way he went about um, doing them. Uh, who also made a beautiful bequest to us. Um, but he he died in uh, in the middle of all of this process, just leaving us bereft. Um, but we still realize that he was there for us. So he's definitely been honored in here. Yeah. Any other questions? May I, may I make a comment? Yeah. Um, stand up so I can see everybody. Yeah. Um, so I'm Helen Bowden, and um, I want to add one more name. Many, many, many years ago, I got a phone call from the then town planner, Al Lima. Oh, yes, yes. Who said, there is a house on the market, and I think the Thorough Country Conservation Alliance should get involved. And I thought, Oh, no. <laughs> one, one more land use battle. Yeah. <laughs> no, we were involved with Middlesex School and some other things, and it was tricky. Thank heavens that call came to us for many reasons, but a personal reason was, you know, you were saying, what did this mean to you? What I think now, when I think about this organization and the successes over many years, is friendship. Yes, absolutely. The friendships that I've made and the bonds that were sort of strengthened over our various comings and goings of in the court in the back room and in the back of the room and Joe Wheeler and Jane and all my friends here, everyone who has supported this. But I brought from home this one more little quote. Oh. Yes. Someone oh, really? I've kept us all for probably almost 15 years from the opening of the Thoreau Institute where I worked for many years. We had an exhibit, Jane was a lifesaver, we would have been sunk without Jane Gordon. But this was one that Jane and I, I think particularly liked, that seems very germane today. So um, it says, from November 20th, 19, oops, nope, 1851, if a man, and let's say women, okay, to that. <laughs> if a man or woman is rich and strong anywhere, it must be on his native soil. Here I have been these 40 years learning the language of these fields that I may the better express myself. Mm. Very apt, yeah, very apt. Yeah, thank you. I don't want to keep you too long, but I just wanted to say that Al Lima is also in the book. He was very willing to be interviewed, and um, I, you, must, you worked with him, Marsha, I, I think. So he, he was an advocate even before Mr. Breen died. So he was looking at the property and working with Mr. Breen in the hope that perhaps something could be done um, to plan ahead. And it never, it never happened, but, but Al was, was very, much, uh, much, very much involved. I mean, it's amazing to see the number of people who 
became part of this story and then who loved being contacted. <laughs> you know, they really want to talk about it. Oh, yes, I remember because it's you know, one of those few things you can point to and you say, really, that you know, we wanted it to happen we, and, it ha and it happened. So it's, um, it's a wonderful thing to look back on. Is, is, is there anybody here who was involved? Uh, did I leave anything out that should have been said that you remember and I've neglected to say? Any other questions? Now, in the spirit of Henry's uh, interest in words and language, uh, does anyone know where the word Virginia Road came from? Why, why Virginia in Concord, Massachusetts? Mm -hmm. Joe, do you know that? I don't know the answer to that. There was a, a, oh, oh, you, I'm sorry. Yeah. a state in England, yeah. uh, after which I believe it was named. Uh, and, and, it was the, the estate of the Wheeler family. It was the home seat of the Wheeler family. In oh. England. Oh. 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 And this was Wheeler territory. Okay. Is up there? Okay. Okay. Okay, so Thank you very much. Yeah.